But now we're going to talk about object-oriented programming in .NET, because .NET is a truly object-oriented language. Three main features of object-oriented programming itself is uh, the first one, which you pretty much do without trying, is uh, called uh, uh, encapsulation. The second one, which you have to work at a little more, is called inheritance, which we're going to be talking about all these things. And uh, the one we're not going to be talking about too, really too much because it's way out of the scope of this class is called polymorphism. So the more you learn about this, especially early in your .NET career, uh, the better programmer you'll be and the better programs you write that don't fall apart. If you don't practice good object-oriented techniques, you will be building a house of cards, and I guarantee you it will fall down. And unfortunately, most programmers don't know the first thing about object-oriented programming. So anybody who's programmed before, what is encapsulation? The first rule of encapsulation is hiding your data. So why do you want to hide your data? really big part is people not changing it when they're not supposed to be and or validation, right? Validation is way, really big in encapsulation and in hiding your data. But my first rule of encapsulation is this. And if you, if you practice this as a programmer, I don't care what language you're using, uh, even if it's not .NET, uh, you will be a better programmer and QA uh, no, you guys are from CN. QA will hardly ever call you. But if you remember this one thing, whenever you're coding, which I do, it's stamped in my brain so much that I don't even think about it anymore. All data is bad until you verify it's good. So if you think of that, because you will always be doing encapsulation. This is the, the first rule of object-oriented object programming, which you do naturally without trying, is encapsulation. When you create a type, you're practicing encapsulation. How well you practice encapsulation is up to you. But when you create a type, you're encapsulating. So if you remember all data coming into your type, and I don't care if it comes through a, a property or a method or whatever, is bad. All data bad. Until you verify it's good, and then you can operate on it. Because the one thing you want to do, which we're going to talk very briefly about in this class, is you do not want to cause an exception. Because if you cause an exception, not only does that horribly slow down your program, but your users are not going to like it. Like we had a partner last week for a day and a half that was pissed at us. is because someone wasn't, you know, catching an exception correctly. So anybody basically clicked on a work item in our program, the program died. The way the CLR supports it is very similar to COM, if you guys come from the COM days. Uh, properties are the first class concept of encapsulation or properties and methods uh, are the first class uh, concepts. Uh, you can do different access modifiers for your members, properties and methods, which we're going to talk more about. Interfaces offer, offer ultimate encapsulation. We don't use a lot of interfaces anymore because they're very hard to version. Encapsulation is a very simple concept. If you remember encapsulation, validating your data, you're pretty much there. Does anybody know what polymorphism is? I always try to ask this, so I don't have to talk all the time. You know, when I say one thing, you know, two people will interpret it differently. That's polymorphism. So basically, just remember this is the same message interpreted differently. I never thought of the girlfriend thing before. I have to keep using that. Uh, this is an example of polymorphism. Most people do not practice this, unfortunately. Uh, but this is really the true, more stable way of programming a .NET if you practice polymorphism. Um, especially when you're doing a large, very, very large, complex program like I, like I work on at work. The base class, actually, which can have functionality or cannot, is uh, the base class for this uh, polymorphism is, example is animal. So everything down here inherits from um, animal. Okay. So animal is a constructor, and it has a, uh, a method called get animal size as a string, get animal type as a string, make noise as a string, and then eat as a string. The first object I'm, in, I'm creating from animal is mammal, okay? And I have a, uh, all c classes have a, have a constructor, an initializer, so I'm not going to talk about that. But here I'm overriding make noise and implementing uh, a make noise for mammal, whatever, that deep, whatever a noise for a mammal is. And I'm also overriding eat and then returning something for mammal, the default implementation for mammal for eat. So you can see here, an animal might eat one way, and a mammal most probably most often will eat a different way, right, with teeth. So now we're going to take it to the next level, 
and we're going to use mammal and we're going to create three more types. So we're going to create a mouse, a feline, and a zebra, which inherit from mammal, which inherits from animal. So a mouse, of course, has a different eat and a different make noise, same as feline and same as zebra, right? But you can see I'm over, only overriding two of these methods in here, right? So a mouse, for example, will have the same uh, functionality. Uh, the get animal size um, in mouse will be the same as it is in, in animal because you can see here I didn't override it, which I should, but I didn't, right? So if I call, so in mouse, there will be a method called get animal size. And if I call that from mouse, it'll return back to me whatever animal did, because that's the last object that overwrote it. So you can see this takes a lot more thinking in architecture, and that's why a lot of people don't do this, unfortunately. And then we can take feline more down even deeper, right, and create a house cat and uh, a tiger uh, out of feline, and then do our implementations for eat and make noise, right? And if I wanted to down here, I could override get animal size if I wanted. So that's polymorphism. And when you have objects that go together like this, especially when you're creating complex types in your, in your application, like a, you know, a student type and a, so example, uh, one of the types I'm designing at work and because, you know, in our database tables, you know, every freaking database table implements uh, like a customer information differently. In one place, it'll be, you know, phone number, address one, address two, zip code, and country, right? In another place, it'll be address one, address two, uh, postal code, and country, right? And another place will be something different, you know? And I'm, as an architect, I take that and go, okay, this is stupid. You know, we're going to create one address type, right? And from that address type, I can create a person that inherits that address type and gets all those things. And it'll be the same no matter what inherits that address type. It'll be the consistent through the program, which is really, really important if you want to create a program that's not only understandable but easy to maintain. So I, as a person, I can choose to implement something else on top as an address type. I could choose to put in cell phone number or something, right? But that's up to person. That's not up to address type. This is how polymorphism works. So at the top here, you can see I have a class called shape, okay? And this is C sharp, and I'm creating a, a virtual method in it called draw. So uh, remember before I said you cannot override a method unless the creator of the base class allows you to do that? So in C sharp, uh, that keyword is virtual. So virtual means an inheriting class can override the functionality of draw. It doesn't have to, but it can. It's up to the person inheriting the class if they want to override draw and implement their own draw. Okay? So that's what virtual means. Um, and in here, we're just returning back a string called default draw behavior. We have a class called polygon, which inherits shape, right? So in Polygon, I'm overriding a draw and then returning this string came from Polygon. See how the polymorphism starts working? Here, if you do shape, it does this. Here, if you do shape, uh, draw, it does this. In Rectangle, we're actually inheriting Polygon and again overriding draw and returning this string came from Rectangle. Then down here, I'm doing square basically wiping out draw completely and doing my own draw. It's not even overriding the other one. It's, it's, it's when you do the new keyword, essentially just wiping out any of the base class imp implementation. So why this is important? Because when you inherit a type, you can always take that inherited type and turn it back to its base type. I can uh, type it into a shape and I can actually get the those methods and default functionality from shape to actually show up from rectangle. The way we do it most of the time nowadays is actually abstract uh, classes and methods. You can also use interfaces, but like I said, we don't use interfaces a ton anymore just because they version really badly. We'll talk more about that. And then of course, polymorphism, you have to use overloading because you're, 
implementing your own implementation of some method. Objects in the in the end become cleaner because there's fewer methods in the actual op, in the actual object you're creating, right? Because you keep inheriting from other objects that have more implementation. Inheritance works. Uh, the derived class or subclass gets all or some of its definitions from the superclass. And the superclass is the base class, basically. Uh, behavior can be replaced or overridden if that's allowed. And if you choose to do it, it's totally up to you. You have a vehicle class. An SUV inherits from vehicle and then automatically gets everything vehicle has and whatever you add on top of it. This is how inheritance works. Public class, I'm sorry, yeah, C sharp, public class circle inherits some shape. In VB, we actually say public uh, class circle inherits shape. Inheritance hierarchies, so uh, the framework itself allows all this to happen. There's two main different types of classes when you do an inheritance, abstract classes. So an abstract class is uh, very similar to a class, uh, but it's not meant to be instantiated directly. So when you create an abstract class, you can't do a new on it. You have to inherit it in another class, and then you can do a new on that derived class. And then concrete classes exist in the application because they're meant to be instantiated. Everything, one way or the other, derives from system.object. And of course, the CTS, common type system, only allows single inheritance. Is object-oriented programming the end of the story? Absolutely not. The next thing you you hopefully will learn, and there are .NET books, ba you know, really good .NET books on this subject, is uh, uh, patterns. So patterns is just a, a way we do object-oriented programming one way or the other. So there's different patterns that we use. There's things like the facade pattern. There's a strategy. The one I have done is singleton. I like this one because it allows only one instance of an object to be created in memory. There's tons and tons of patterns. And there's actually, um, like I said, there's entire books just to talk about patterns. And actually, some of the better books are actually not even the .NET pattern books. Because no matter what pattern it is, basically, you can implement it in .NET. And Microsoft has an entire website based on patterns. It's, if you Google Microsoft Patterns and Practices, uh, it'll take you to the MSDN site. Again, I'm getting back to the whole house of cards thing. You know, if you don't use object-oriented programming and patterns, uh, your house will tumble.